Hello, AP Bio. Welcome to another week of online distance learning uh, from AP Bio. I hope you guys all had a nice weekend and everyone's staying safe and you're getting used to this online learning. Um, for this week, um, all of the links are available through Schoology with the exception of the AP Classroom assignments. Um, so obviously you're watching this screencast now, um, but the AP Classroom assignments, there's a multiple choice and a free response practice for you guys to work on. Um, just make sure you get that completed by this Friday. Um, we're going to have a Schoology quiz that you can take on Wednesday. Uh, counts as a quiz grade. Try to do that without looking anything up, just to see what you're um, able to do uh, in the multiple choice format for this topic. And then there's a homework. It's a short one. Um, this is due on Friday the 10th. This counts as a homework grade. And again, that's on Schoology. So you guys will be able to access that um, and type everything in in Schoology and submit through Schoology that way. Okay. All right, great. So let's move on to some self signaling. Okay, so cellular signaling. Um, is basically about getting a signal from the outside of a cell to the inside of a cell. Um, so this is going to involve uh, signaling molecules, and the most common signaling molecules are hormones. Okay, hormones when they bind to the outside of a cell, or if they go into a cell, which we'll get into, they actually have two ways of working. They can either attach to the outside and send a signal in, or they can directly go into the cell and activate signals within the cell. But their job is to really regulate metabolism. Okay, um, and so we know that there are chemical messengers that affect metabolism. Um, metabolism can include both anabolic, which are synthetic, synthesizing, building, creating things, um, or it can also involve catabolic, which would involve digestion, hydrolyzing, breaking compounds down. So some examples of this um, metabolism, we have protein synthesis. This is anabolic, building proteins. Uh, enzyme activation, so activating an enzyme can go either way. We can have enzymes that are involved in synthesizing, like DNA, right? We have DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase. We also have digestive enzymes, like lactase um, and proteases, which can break down substances. Uh, we also have changes in membrane permeability. Um, insulin does this. Insulin, when it binds to a cell membrane, changes the permeability of the membrane to permit glucose to enter. Um, mitotic division, cell division. Okay, synthetic um, part of metabolism. We are creating new cells, we're building. And finally, the release of enzymes, hormones, and any other secretion, that's all going to be involved in regulating and monitoring metabolism. Okay, um, interesting thing with uh, hormones is the majority of hormones are produced by endocrine cells that release these molecules, these hormones, into the bloodstream. And these are known as endocrine signals. Endocrine glands are glands that secrete their substances into the blood so that they can reach all parts of the body. Uh, hormones that target other glands, they're known as tropins. These are known as tropic hormones. Um, and so we have things like gonadotropins, which are secreted from the pituitary and they affect the gonads, okay, their testes and ovaries. That'll stimulate the release of testosterone and estrogen. Um, so there are different types of hormones that can bind to different targets and ones that happen to target glands, they're known as tropic hormones. Okay. So hormones main role is in signal transduction. Now signal transduction um, is a pathway that links the reception of a signal with a cellular response. So basically to transduce means to transfer the signal from outside the cell to inside the cell. Okay, so signaling always begins with the recognition of a chemical messenger. Chemical messenger can be a hormone, right? Um, it, those are known as ligands, okay? And so a chemical messenger, also known as a ligand, is going to bind to a receptor, okay? A ligand is a molecule that binds to or interacts with any kind of protein. Different receptors are going to be able to react with different types of chemical messengers. That's why we have all the specificity in our body, right? It's basically a one-to-one -one re relationship. One hormone binds to one receptor, and that triggers a specific response inside the cell. Um, so different messengers can act on the cell. Um, we can have small peptides, which are short pieces of amino acids. We can have hormones, which we've talked about a little bit. Um, and we'll expand on that a little bit more, like lipids and proteins. Uh, we also have neurotransmitters and antibodies. Okay, these bind to receptors and they trigger a response inside the cell. For neurotransmitters, they're going to stimulate nerve impulses. For antibodies, 
when they bind to a cell, it triggers the cell to self-destruct or fall apart. Okay. So these are examples of ligands that when they bind to a receptor, it triggers a response inside the cell. Okay. Um, now in multicellular organisms, we're going to find that signal transduction pathways, they coordinate what goes on within the individual cell, and that's going to affect tissues as a whole. So we know that hormones are specifically involved in signal transduction pathways and that some hormones, specifically the protein ones, they bind to receptors and function as ligands on the outside of the cell. Okay? And so receptors that are bound to the membrane of a cell have two general regions. They have what's called a ligand binding domain and an intracellular domain. Signaling always begins with the recognition of a chemical messenger by the receptor. And that usually happens on the outside of the cell where there's a ligand binding domain. And this ligand binding domain right here attaches to the ligand. And when that ligand attaches, it triggers a response inside the cell, it causes the receptor to change shape, right? So it's allosteric, right? Allosteric proteins change shape. And so when that receptor changes shape, it triggers a transduction response inside the cell. And it activates different types of compounds, compounds such as second messengers. Okay, And what they do is they act like a relay. They relay the signal to other proteins and enzymes inside the cell. And in doing so, they amplify, they magnify the signal. So that signal that started with the ligand on the outside of the cell becomes larger. It becomes more intense. Okay, um, And so the receptors, this is just a bigger picture of what this looks like. Um, and these little bullet points basically sum it up, right? A ligand binds to the receptor. The receptor sends a message to the cell's interior. That's transduction. The receptor changes shape, and that triggers molecules in the cell to respond, okay? And that tells the, the molecules inside the cell how to react to produce different substances, okay? So signals basically move across the plasma membrane when a receptor protein recognizes a signal molecule. The receptor changes shape, right? It's allosterically activated, and that initiates transduction of the signal. Protein hormones specifically bind to receptors, and they initiate what's called a second messenger. Okay, a second messenger permits the signal to reach the target inside the cell. They transfer the message inside the cell. So a second messenger is really part of a relay system that's inside of the cell, that transfers the message, okay? And that triggers activity in the cell. So in signal transduction, the external signal, the outside signal is converted to an internal response, okay? And I'll say that again. The signal transduction process is the process by which the external signal, an outside signal, converts to an internal response. This would be, let's take, for example, in school, um, if we can remember what school was like. Um, I want to get a message to Dr. Spada, right? So I want to get a message to Spada. So I'm outside the room. I'm outside his classroom. The door's shut. I want to get a message to someone. So what I would do is I would knock on the door, okay? And Spada would then come to the door and I would pass him a message, okay? And then he would take that message from me and then pass it on to one of the students in the class. Now that message may have someone's name on it. What will happen is everybody in turn will pass that message on until it gets to the person it's supposed to get to. Okay, it's kind of like the game of telephone. Okay, now that's known as a signaling cascade. So that message gets relayed from the receptors, right, which was the door of Spotter's classroom to the cell targets, right? Now sometimes what will happen is we'll amplify the signal. So that's going to make the signal louder, right, or stronger. And that triggers a specific response inside the cell. The second messenger is essential to the function of the cascade. And many signal transduction pathways include modifying proteins, right, changing the structure of enzymes, um, phosphorylation cascades, right, in which a bunch of proteins um, add phosphate, right? They're going to add phosphate to different compounds. Um, and that triggers the next enzyme to work, which then phosphorylates the next enzyme. So phosphorylation cascades are kind of like um, baton relays in track, where one runner has the baton, and they're going to pass it to the next person, and then the next runner is going to take that baton and run and pass it to the next person. And
and each time a person gets that baton, they immediately start to run, right? So the baton is a lot like the phosphate group. And each time you pass that phosphate to the next person, to the next protein, it triggers a reaction, okay? In the case of a relay race, it triggers the person to run, okay? So that's a cascade. Um, now, the hormones, the way they work, are very different. So protein hormones, we know they can't enter the cell, right? They are unable to enter the cell. They're too big, okay? They're also not soluble in lipids, okay? So they cannot bind to the lipid bilayer because they're made of protein. Okay, they have a charge, okay, which definitely lipids do not like. And they're also too big, okay? They're large and they're charged. They can't get through the membrane. Um, they're hydrophilic. They attract lots of water. And they have lots of charge. So they have to use the second messenger, okay? And they bind to the receptors, which trigger second messenger activities, okay? They trigger this relay cascade inside the cell. Examples of second messengers include cyclic AMP, Inositol triphosphate and calcium ions. Okay. Um, but cyclic AMP and IP3, these are the two most common second messengers. These are given as examples um, so that you can grasp the fact that, okay, proteins need to activate some kind of messenger inside the cell in order for their message to reach their target. Okay. Now, steroid hormones, because they're made of lipids, they enter the cell directly, um, they're lipid soluble. They're hydrophobic, and when they what they do is they go into the cell, and they bind to a protein. That protein is called a nuclear hormone receptor. Okay, it's a receptor that's inside the cytosol. Okay, once that hormone binds to that receptor, the hormone carries. I'm sorry, the nuclear hormone receptor carries the hormone to the nucleus, and it binds to the DNA. So steroid hormones have a direct impact on gene expression. Okay, and so they can control gene expression, they can control protein synthesis, and they can also function as activators or repressors. Okay, so these can function in activating genes or inhibiting genes. Okay, but the key thing for a steroid hormone, okay, an example of one would be something like estrogen, is their receptor is inside the cell. So once the estrogen passes through the bilayer and goes into the cell, it binds to its receptor, and that receptor with the hormone attached to it and then go to the DNA and activate genes, okay? So protein hormones, this is how they operate. This is a great picture. Um, they're hydrophilic and they're lipophobic, which means they're fat-hating, okay? Which means they can't freely cross the membrane. So they attach to receptors, okay? So this is the peptide hormone, the protein, protein hormone. They attach to a receptor, and then that receptor activates the relay, okay? It activates a series of intracellular molecules, right? This is the cascade that triggers a response inside the cell. These are your second messenger molecules. The hormone is the first messenger, which acts on the outside of the cell, and the second messengers, they act on the inside of the cell, okay? And as you go through this relay with signal transduction, you increase the number of molecules activated. So there's our amplification. That's how we build the signal until that signal reaches its target. Now, in this case, it's targeting the DNA. So this is gonna activate gene expression, but really these signals can change all sorts of things inside the cell. They can activate other enzymes. Okay, they can stimulate enzyme activity. They can activate processes within the cell, like cell division, DNA replication. They can also change the permeability of the membrane. Okay, the key thing with the second messengers is they enable amplification of the initial signal. Okay. Um, a steroid hormone goes right through the membrane. So you can see here um, at step one that the steroid hormone binds to a protein carrier, okay, that's in the blood, and it travels through the blood this way. Once it gets to a target cell, that steroid hormone gets released and it passes through the membrane. When it passes through the membrane, it attaches to a nuclear hormone receptor. This is in this case, if this is estrogen, this would be the estrogen receptor. And then together, the hormone and the hormone receptor pass through the nucleus. They go into the DNA, bind to the DNA, and they trigger gene transcription. Okay, what they do is they stimulate the formation of messenger RNA, which can then be utilized to form protein. 
Okay, so a steroid hormone goes right into the cell and then goes right into the nucleus where it binds to the DNA and activates genes. Okay, a steroid hormone, again, it's known as lipophilic, it's fat loving. So they diffuse freely across the membrane. Here it is, it goes right across the membrane. It encounters the receptor. And then that receptor complex, the hormone and the protein receptor, the hormone receptor, then can pass right into the nucleus where it binds to the DNA and it activates gene transcription. Okay, steroid hormones are things like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. Protein hormones, examples of those, I'll go back a second, are things like insulin, glucagon, leptin, ADH, oxytocin. Okay, those hormones bind to the membrane and trigger a response on the inside. Okay. Um, so second messengers, they're going to relay, right? They're relaying signals from the receptors on the cell surface to the target molecules in the cell. So they're going to pass the message along. Now, since protein hormones cannot enter the cell, they must utilize a second messenger. So the thing to remember is the protein hormone, only the protein hormone uses a second messenger. Steroid hormones don't. And cyclic AMP, the most common one. Okay, when cyclic AMP is activated, it's activated because a protein hormone binds to a receptor and it activates a G protein. Okay, now one example of one is a protein called RAS. Okay, it was found in rats. Uh, but G proteins, what they have the capacity to do is interact with GTP and they make GDP, right? GTP is guanine triphosphate. Okay, so what they do is they allow that to be dephosphorylated, and they activate another enzyme. Okay, the G protein activates adenylyl cyclase. And adenylyl cyclase can then react with ATP to make this stuff called cyclic AMP. I have diagrams to show you guys this. It makes it much clearer. Cyclic AMP goes on to activate other proteins. It has the capacity to activate Things like ion channels. It can change permeability of the membrane. It can activate other enzymes. Okay, cyclic AMP is the most common second messenger. It's one of the most prevalent ones in all of our cells, and that's why this is used as an example. Okay? Cyclic AMP activates a protein called protein kinase, which can phosphorylate proteins. Remember, I mentioned before about how the phosphate is like the baton in a relay, and so that that phosphate can get passed on from protein to protein, and that can trigger responses within the cell. So things like adrenaline and glucagon, they use cyclic AMP, okay? Um, here's a little diagram of how this works. So here's a hormone, okay? The hormone binds to the receptor and it activates a G protein. That G protein slides along the membrane to another protein called adenylate cyclase or adenylate cyclase. This activates cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP then activates other proteins, which can trigger things like enzymatic activity, cellular secretion, and opening ion channels. The key thing here is the hormone activates the receptor, which then activates the G protein, which then activates adenylyl cyclase. This is something that can be regulated. You can bring in to the cell inhibitory molecules that can block the receptor that can block the G protein that can block adenylyl cyclase. So we have the ability to control this and regulate how much cyclic AMP is being made. The more cyclic AMP, the stronger the response from inside the cell. So there are different types of compounds that can be introduced to this, which can block or reduce the activity of these second messengers. Okay. It is complicated. Yes. Multi-step pathways. Multi-step pathways always mean greater control, greater regulation, okay? It also means things can go wrong. You can bring in a substance that can alter the shape of the protein and turn it down. Um, you can bring in a substance, right? You can have a substance that's similar to the hormone that mimics the hormone that permanently attaches to the receptor. And what that can do is cause the receptor to stay in the on position all the time, and now you're going to send that signal to tell a cell to do things like divide, okay? That could result in cancer. Um, another second messenger is called an acetyl triphosphate. Okay, an acetyl triphosphate, very similar to cyclic AMP. The difference is the type of hormone being activated. Uh, I'm sorry, protein being activated. So for example, here's a hormone, binds to the receptor. The receptor activates the G protein. 
G protein slides over, activates another protein called phospholipase C. So instead of activating adenyl cyclase, we activate phospholipase C. This triggers the formation of an acetal triphosphate. Okay, now what does an acetal triphosphate do? It's a second messenger. It stimulates the endoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. Lots of proteins in our cells are controlled by calcium. Calcium binds as a cofactor and it can trigger activity in the cell. It can change the shape of the enzymes, stimulating them to work. Okay, so the difference here is you have just a different protein being activated, which activates a different second messenger. Okay, and that's IP3, an acetyl triphosphate. Okay, this picture here just gives you a little summary of how second messengers work. So at the top diagram, we can see that the second messenger is not activated yet. Okay, now when the hormone binds, notice what it does to the protein. It changes its shape. When that shape changes, it permits the G protein to attach, which can then activate an enzyme. Okay, and what it'll do is it'll activate this enzyme and trigger a reaction when, within the cell. So let's take a look at what this looks like. Okay, we'll pull this animation up. Here it is. Okay, here's our hormone. Binds to the receptor. The receptor changes shape, and it activates a G protein. G protein phosphorylates this purple membrane-bound protein, which activates the second messenger. The second messenger was that little red thing. So I'll show you again. Protein hormone binds, activates the receptor. Receptor activates a G protein. G protein activates another protein, which triggers the formation of the second messenger. Okay. Now, if you bring in an inhibitory molecule that binds to this receptor, you can either shut this process down or trigger this process to stay on all the time. Now, hormone will only bind temporarily, but a different type of compound might bind permanently which would trigger this to stay on, okay? And that would result in overproduction of a second messenger, okay? So that's something they may ask you on the AP test. They may ask you to explain what would happen if an inhibitory molecule bound, how would that impact this particular compound and the production of the second messenger? Or maybe on the inside of the cell, ooh, something binds to this. What would that do? That would prevent your second messenger molecule from being activated. Okay, right now this protein is off. It's allosterically inhibited. By adding the phosphate, we now activate it, and we can convert our inactive second messenger to an active form. Okay? All right. Back to the PowerPoint we go. Okay. So, inositol triphosphate works the same way. Okay? When a protein hormone binds to a receptor, it activates a G protein. GTPases activate a different protein bound to the membrane. In this case, it's phospholipase C. Okay? When this gets activated, we trigger the formation of inositol triphosphate. This triggers the release of calcium ions, which can affect calcium-sensitive proteins inside the cytoplasm. Okay. okay. Some other mechanisms. Okay, circadian rhythms, biological clocks. Right now, most of our biological clocks are all out of whack because we're getting up at a different time. We're off of our normal school schedule. So for some of you guys, you're sleeping till noon. To at 2 p.m. maybe, you're up late till 2, 3 a.m., so your system is off a bit. We're all off, okay? But a normal circadian rhythm is a rhythm that operates within a 24-hour period where there are always two sub-periods. There's a light sub-period and a dark sub-period, okay? So there's a dark phase and a light phase, okay? Um, we always have that. We have when we're resting and when we're awake. Um, this is controlled by the pineal gland, and the pineal gland secretes a hormone called melatonin, which controls sleep patterns. So some people, like my daughters, take melatonin at night right now to help themselves sleep because they're so off in their routine um, that this helps them get to sleep and sleep a little bit longer. Okay, um, But it's a naturally produced substance from the pineal gland. Um, other compounds include, include things called Prostaglandins. A prostaglandin is a compound that exerts an effect on a small group of cells in one area. Okay, and so these prostaglandins um, don't affect the entire body, they just have a local effect. A great example of this is blood clotting. Okay, um, you don't want your blood to clot in your entire circulatory system, you would die. 
um, if it happened at once. But when you get a cut, prostaglandins stimulate blood clotting just at one location. So it's very specialized to that one location so that you have a controlled response. Um, and then the other type of compound are pheromones. Pheromones are odorless, colorless compounds that are released by organisms, mostly to attract mates, but they can also use it for recognition of resources. So a lot of insect traps have pheromones of the opposite sex in there so that you can, can, you can trap these insects. So they think they're going to go in there and find a mate, and they go in there and they get stuck and they die, right? Um, not a nice way to live. Um, but it can also be used for recognition of resources. Termites form trails with pheromones so that their companions in their nest can go out, follow the trail, and go to a food source. So this trailing permits them to identify a food source that they can go back to again and again. So they can continue to destroy and break down wood structures. Okay. All right. Now feedback. Feedback inhibition is a process where you inhibit the production of a hormone. So here's a regulatory pathway in tropic hormones, right? And again, a tropic hormone is a hormone that binds to other glands. So the hypothalamus, which is located in the brain, will release what's called a releasing hormone. Okay. And this releasing hormone is a tropin called thyrotropin releasing hormone. Okay. Thyrotropin releasing hormone binds to the pituitary and activates the pituitary to release a stimulating hormone. Okay, the pituitary stimulates all the other glands in the body. It's known as the master gland. So the pituitary is going to release a stimulating hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone. Okay, thyroid stimulating hormone, guess what it stimulates? Right, the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is the target. When this target gland is stimulated, in this case the thyroid, it releases thyroxine. Now thyroxine is a hormone that stimulates metabolism. So the thyroxine levels will start to increase. Once they get to a certain level where you have a decent amount of it floating around in the blood, it becomes detectable. It becomes detectable by receptors. So receptors that are on the pituitary will detect the presence of thyroxine and that shuts down pituitary functioning. Okay, It inhibits the production of thyroxine. This way you produce exactly the amount of thyroxine you need and you don't overproduce it because you don't want metabolism becoming excessive. The other feedback mechanism is the thyroxine can also affect the hypothalamus. So this will also shut the hypothalamus down. So there's basically a, a two-pronged approach here and it seems a bit redundant. Okay, You can stimulate the production of thyroxine, which would then inhibit the pituitary, but it also inhibits the hypothalamus. So this feedback inhibition basically shuts down both hormones. Okay, if you just shut down the pituitary here, um, you'd still have the hypothalamus secreting the thyrotropin releasing hormone. So what would happen is, okay, fine, you, you turn off the pituitary, but the hypothalamus still works. So really you need to inhibit all the way back to the beginning, to the top of the line. Okay, and what this does is this ensures that you only produce the appropriate amount of thyroxine that's needed to increase metabolism. Okay, the same thing happens with insulin and glucagon. Okay, when a person eats, um, there's an increasing amount of glucose in the blood as we eat food. Right, our stomach breaks it down and sugar goes into the blood, and this gets detected by um, insulin secreting cells in the pancreas, specifically um, in the islet cells. So when a person eats food, these these glands, uh, the cells in this gland detect the increase in glucose and it triggers the release of insulin. Insulin causes levels of glucose to decrease. Now, if the glucose levels drop, that's going to inhibit the production of insulin. That's going to result in a negative feedback loop because your initial response to the increase of glucose was to secrete insulin. Secreting insulin lowers the glucose levels, which then inhibits insulin. So that's negative feedback. If it was positive feedback, you would increase your insulin secretion. Okay. So because it's negative, you're decreasing your initial response, which was to secrete insulin. Pretty much all hormones work this way as a negative feedback loop. Okay. Um, here's another one. 
uh, blood calcium levels are regulated by the parathyroid glands. Parathyroids are located within the thyroid gland. There are actually two small glands on either side embedded within our thyroid. Their job is to increase blood calcium levels. We need calcium in the blood so that we can contract muscles and stimulate activity within cells. If our calcium levels go too low, the parathyroid glands secrete parathyroid hormone. What this does is it triggers the intestines and the kidneys to absorb calcium back into the bloodstream. Okay, it tells these two organs to retain calcium. Um, it also stimulates the bone to release calcium. So this will actually cause our bones to lose calcium. Okay? The importance of this is to increase blood calcium levels so that the body can function normally. Now, once the calcium levels go up, we inhibit the secretion of the parathyroid hormone in response to higher levels of calcium. So this hormone is only secreted when there's low levels of calcium. Once the calcium levels are increased, we then shut it down. We don't want to overproduce calcium in the blood. We don't want to take more calcium out of the bone than is necessary. Okay? So that's negative feedback. If it was positive feedback, what we would do is continue to secrete this hormone. But negative feedback, what that will do is it'll inhibit the secretion of parathormone. Okay? That's it as far as cell signaling. A okay? um, couple of things. Let me just put this back so you're not staring at a blank screen. Okay. The way it works with these screencasts is you can go back and play these again. So please go back, repeat these, go through it again, make sure that you really understand all of this. I will tell you that on the AP exam, they tend to really focus on feedback. They like to talk about feedback mechanisms, and they like to give you scenarios where you have to predict what would happen if you inhibited um, the production of the substance that the hormone is working on, right? So like in this case, what would happen if you stopped increasing blood calcium levels, okay, and your calcium levels went down? Oh, then you'd start secreting more power hormone. So make sure that when you look at a feedback mechanism that you're able to identify the hormone, what the hormone is producing, and the fact that the end product of the hormone's production, right, in this case, increasing calcium levels is going to shut down that hormone. That's negative feedback, okay? We look at insulin again. I'm going to back up for a second. We secrete insulin in response to glucose levels going up. Well, once the glucose levels go down, we stop secreting insulin, okay? It's negative feedback. Same thing happens with body temperature. Body temperature goes up, we sweat. Once our temperature comes down, we stop sweating. That's negative feedback. If it was positive feedback, we would continue to sweat and continue to make the temperature go down. But we get to a certain point where the temperature gets back to where it's supposed to be, and we shut that process off. Okay. So that's everything with cell signaling. Um, this is really just a, a small component of a larger topic that we used to cover. Um, so again, the important things to get out of this is understanding the differences between protein and steroid hormones, um, knowing what happens with second messengers, how they are involved in relaying the signal from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell, and that that only happens with protein hormones. Steroid hormones do not use second messengers because they can go right through the membrane. Okay? All right, so that's it. Um, so again, for the rest of the week, I'm going to back this up. So that we can see um, what I had up as the, the main the main points. Okay. Um, so again, for this week, from the beginning. Um, now that you're done with the screencast, um, you can do some of those AP classroom assignments. Okay. They're going to be graded just as a completion, just that they're complete. All right. We want you get to become comfortable with these. Um, there will be a quiz Wednesday, multiple choice, very basic, but again. You know, try to do it without the notes, see how good you do on it. Um, and then the homework will also help you with that as well. And that's due on Friday. Okay. Um, during this week, we're also going to put up some information about the AP exam so that you guys get a better sense of it. Um, Doc and I are working to put together some practice questions. Um, I feel that this could be a really successful exam for a lot of you guys because um, they don't seem to be focusing on deep content. Uh, it looks like the exam is going to focus more on 
uh, interpretation analytical stuff. So we'll get you caught up on that in a little bit. Um, but again, there's our plan for the week. Um, enjoy the week. Stay safe. Um, please stay home. And if you need help with anything, please reach out by email or by remind. Uh, you know, Doc and I are always here to help. Okay. So hang in there, guys. Um, there's your plan for the week. And reach out if you need help. Okay. We'll talk to you soon. Be well.